In this episode, you'll learn some disability vocabulary so that you can talk about disability without offending anyone by using politically incorrect or wrong words. Welcome to Aprender Inglés with Reza and Craig. Hello, and if you're a new listener to the podcast, you're very, very welcome. My name's Craig. And my name is Reza. And Reza and I have nearly 50 years of teaching between us, and we're going to use that experience to help you improve your English and take it up to the next level. How are you, Reza? I'm fine, Craig. How are you? How are things? I'm very well, thank you. Happy New Year to you and to all our listeners. Yes, I'm really looking forward to this year because, let's be honest, it can't be worse than last year, can it? Well, let's not count our chickens before they're hatched. Let's not try to predict too much what's going to happen this year. If you're listening to this podcast way, way, way in the future, we're recording at the end of December 2021. And when you listen to this, it will be 2022 or later. So Happy New Year if you're listening to it immediately after we publish. Yes, we're hoping by then that the word pandemic is not so commonly used. But back in December 2021, if you're um, far in the future, check it out on the internet and you'll see what a mess the world was in. And whatever you're doing this holiday period, wherever you are, please stay safe, be careful and enjoy the holidays with your family. Before we get into the main topic of today's podcast, I'd like to say hello to two people. First of all, hi to friend of the show Jose Ignacio from Chile, who I was lucky enough to meet recently here in Valencia. He was passing through with his sister touring around Europe. So it was lovely to see you, Jose. And also a shout out to Santiago Ramos from Argentina, who sent us an email recently. Reza, could you read Santiago's email? Sure. Santiago writes, Hi, guys. My name is Santiago. I'm from Tucumán, Argentina, and I just want to share with you the number of listened episodes from the year 2021. Spotify has calculated, and I've listened to 237 episodes. Wow. Thanks for everything. Wow. Thank you, Santiago. Thank you very much, Santiago. And I didn't realize that Spotify send their customers at the end of the year a summary of what they've listened to during the past year. I don't know if you're a paying customer of Spotify. I use it, but I don't pay. I use the free version, so I did not get a summary of listens. But I noticed on Twitter that many people have been tweeting their listening record of Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig and everything they've listened to in 2021. So thank you if you've done that. And thank you, Santiago, for your message. Yes, those people, including Santiago, you may not realize it, but I'm afraid you might be an air alcoholic. What's an air alcoholic for our new listeners? Well, it's not an alcoholic. It's not about alcohol. Air alcoholic, A I R C alcoholic is someone who is addicted to aprender inglés con Reza y Craig, A-I-R-C. So you may be alcoholics. I think help is available. Yep. If you see a specialist, you can <laughs> have the addiction slowly treated. Yeah, and they'll take away your Spotify subscription. And speaking of Spotify, we're speaking today about disability. And I'm curious how people who have maybe a visual dis a disability, maybe their sight impaired and have problems seeing small text, how is Spotify's accessibility for you? Are you happy with the way that Spotify makes its features accessible to you? And also our webpage at inglespodcast.com is something that I try to improve but I don't know how to. So if you have a disability and you do go and visit the, the podcast website, please let us know if we can improve it in any way. The only thing I know to do for you is to write 
a description of the images that we put on the website so that if you can't see the images, at least a screen reader will read and describe the image to you. Apart from that, I don't know what else we can do. So please tell us if we can improve the website in any way. First, we have a message from Daniela from Argentina, who is currently studying for the IELTS exam. Hi Reza, hi Greg, I'm Daniela, I'm from Argentina. I already sent you a voice message a few months ago, I think. Um, I have a question. I'm studying for IELTS and I'm coming across with words like consequently, ultimately, and in some words between the T and the L, uh, there's an E, and in another words like consequently, there isn't. Uh, I want to know if there's any rule or something to remember. Thank you for everything. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> Thank you very much, Daniela, for your message. It was a wonderful message, very clear. We understood absolutely everything. Um, and an interesting question with quite a simple answer, Reza, don't you think? I think so, Daniela, unless you are more cunning than you appear and you're going to catch us out. What does cunning mean? Cunning means astute, but in a, in a, in a devious, in a negative way. Like you've, you've set a trap for us, but I'm sure you haven't. I think the answer is, when is there an E on the adverb? When there's an E on the adjective? I think that's, I can't think of any exceptions. In other words, if the adjective ends in E, like ultimate, just add L-Y. So you don't take the E away. Consequent doesn't end in an E. Don't add one. It has no E. As far as I know, Craig, there's, there's no trick, is there? It's just that. Nope, I think that's it. So beautiful, no E, beautifully. Obviously, double L, you double the L. Senseless, senselessly. Intelligent, intelligently. So it's just adding L-Y, whether or not there's an E at the end of the adjective. So it's as simple as that. One small thing, Daniela, from your message, which was very, very good, but I did notice you added an extra preposition with the phrasal verb to come across. To come across means to find by accident. For example, I came across an old picture when I was looking through my photograph album, for example. And you said, Daniela, I'm coming across with words like consequently. No, no with. So I'm coming across words like consequently and ultimately. By the way, Daniela, I'm not sure if you know or not, but we have actually recorded some podcasts with information about IELTS. In numerical order, you could go to number 15. So that's englishpodcast.com slash 1515. Also 24, so the same, englishpodcast.com slash 24. But above all, episode 68, which is about TOEFL, the American version, and IELTS, the more international version, <laughs> about those exams. And also episode 236, so put englishpodcast.com slash 236. And that episode is is about reading in the IELTS. So you'll get quite a lot of useful information, I hope, going through all those episodes, Daniela. And thank you very much for your message. Now we get to the main topic of today's podcast, disability. And this was inspired by Carla from Rio de Janeiro, who also sent us a voice message. <laughs> Hi, Craig. This is Carla from Rio de Janeiro, and I hope you are doing well, both of you. So I will try to be brief this time. I am finishing my, my undergraduate in tourism this year, 2021. My final paper is about the lack of information for people that use wheelchair users and blind people and deaf people and of kind of handicap. So that that is my difficult because I don't know how to refer to that people without being offensive 
are not politically correct. So if it's, is it possible to use an euphemism, something less harsh? So I hope you can answer me this question. And if you want to talk more about the, this subject, it will be very, very useful for me. So see you, see you, no, not see you soon because I will not see you, but I hope see you someday. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Craig, what about if we tell the listeners quickly, because we don't want to focus on it, but let you know some words that you should not use. So you might see these words, you might hear these words, but if we were you, we wouldn't use them. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Let's talk about the words you should avoid and not use, and then we'll focus on words that you can use. So we've already said handicap or handicapped. Don't use that. Don't write that, Carla. Another word that you should keep away from, don't use this, invalid. Invalid, the noun, an invalid, an extremely offensive word these days. And I don't know, Reza, what you think, but when I hear the Spanish translation, menos valido, that reminds me of that word, and it doesn't translate well into English, even though I'd be interested to hear from you and from Spanish listeners if there's a newer, more up-to-date, politically correct word for menos valido, but it sounds to me not a very modern way to describe people. I don't know. Yes, I'm still hearing particularly older people say it, but it's not, it's also regarded as offensive by most people who might be labeled with that word. They prefer discapacitado, yeah? Or there are other terms such as diversidad funcional. Okay. But people do say it. I find it terrible because being a person interested in linguistics, I just immediately think of the composition of the word. Menos, valido. Yes, exactly. Less valid. Like, you can't possibly say that someone's less valid. Exactly. That's, that's my problem with it. So, um, yeah. Another word you should definitely not use, and that's cripple. Uh, by the way, you can see all of these words in the show notes listed at inglespodcast.com slash 397. So avoid using invalid, handicap, and cripple. Definitely offensive these days. Although I can think of one exception where the word crippled is good, but it's nothing to do with people. The economy has been crippled by the pandemic. We use it also metaphorically. So not for a person, but for an economy and a government, an organization. If they are crippled, it means their capacity has been severely reduced. So you can use it as regards things, not people, and it's not offensive in any way. But I wouldn't use it for a person. Absolutely. Another example, the crippling effects financially of the coronavirus pandemic. Can you think of any more words, Reza, that people should stay away from and avoid using? Yes. Now, I'm no expert in this, and neither is Craig, if I may be so bold as to say so. But the American word lame, I would stay away from it. We're not Americans, so neither of us are experts. You will hear it a lot. You still hear it on shows and TV and films, but I checked up on internet and apparently in the American disabled community, people don't like it being used. So the word lame means that you don't walk properly because you've got some kind of problem with your legs. So you don't walk as you would if you have no problems with your legs, put it like that. But here's the problem. In American English, the word lame is used colloquially to mean not very good. Yeah. And that's where disabled people really take offense then. And so if you call them lame, it's like, what? You're saying I'm not very good? It's like, oh, what a lame film. People used to say it's so lame. Or, oh, you can't come to the party because you're tired. That's a lame excuse. It's a pathetic excuse. So people with disabilities object to being called lame because it has that connotation. Of course, you can call an animal lame. They wouldn't mind. A lame horse, for example, has a problem with its leg. Another word to avoid is dumb, D-U-M-B. Now, when I was younger, it was frequently used in conversation and in the media and films, but it means to be unable to speak. So if you cannot speak, that's what it means. But again, don't use it these days because it could be and often is offensive. That's D-U-M-B. A thing, unfortunately, my parents often used to say to me when I didn't get the results in school they were hoping for, they would say in their not very politically correct way, are you mentally retarded or something? Like you got two out of 10? 
that sounds really offensive these yep. days. But I guess in the in the the nineteen seventies or eighties, you perhaps you wouldn't be criticised. But I would avoid that expression these days because originally it referred to people with a mental disabilities. But it was also used as an insult, like my parents telling me to study harder, you know, not not to be so silly. So that's another one to avoid. Mentally retarded. Stay away from that one. Also, for people who are shorter than the average height, many years ago, they may have been called a midget, M-I-D-G-E-T. That also is losing usage and it is often offensive to people who are not as tall as other people. The correct way to say that would be a person of short stature, S-T-A-T-U-R-E, or maybe a person with restricted growth. To grow is the verb, and growth, G-R-O-W-T-H, is the noun, so restricted growth. And the last one which I can think of, which you should avoid, is abnormal. Abnormal in the sense of with mental or psychological behavior, which is not normal. That used to be used, but it does not sound good these days. However, like cripple, there is an exception. Doctors do use the word abnormal, but when they talk about a particular body function, so you might have abnormal liver function or abnormal circulatory system, that's okay if it's a specific body part, but not in the sense of your mental or psychological behavior, then you would not say abnormal these days. Right. So keep away from those words, but let's look at some words that you can use, and especially Carla would be interested in this. Now, according to Collins, Collins Dictionary, the word disabled is kind of okay. You can use that. So a disabled person has a disability, and the opposite, the antonym, is non-disabled. So a non-disabled person does not have a disability, or a person without a disability is another way to say the same thing. It's not a good idea to call these non-disabled people able-bodied. Now, that's an expression that I remember from years ago as well. Do you remember that, able-bodied? Yes, and there's a few collocations with it which have stuck in my mind, like able-bodied seaman. Do you remember that expression? Yes. Yeah, because if you're a sailor, a seaman, a man who goes to sea, it's important for you to be physically fit. And you used to say, we need all able-bodied seamen to get on the ship and go and sail, whatever they said. So able-bodied seamen, but it sounds a bit, a bit antiquated, a bit archaic now. Yeah, it does. It does. And as I mentioned, a person with disability is a good way to describe a person with a disability, because you're putting the person first. And in the world of being politically correct, the person is more important than the disability. So a person with a disability sounds better than a disabled person. And Craig, I think we could, without offending people, categorize the disability a bit more specifically so you could say a person with a disability or you could be more specific you could say a person with a mental health disability a person with a learning disability a person with emotional disability can you think of any more there's physical disability so a person with a physical disability and somebody who doesn't speak as other people do could have a speech disability so this person has a speech disability now a term which i came across recently because a friend of mine did a course about this topic is the term functional diversity that's a very modern and i guess you might say politically correct pc politically correct term for disability so that's the most modern and least offensive of all the terms I've heard so far. And interestingly, I checked into the origins of it, and it actually originated in Spain. 
So it's a Spanish idea, diversidad funcional, which got translated later into English and has become popular in English. But it actually started in Spain, curiously enough. Yeah, I quite like it. It's a nice way of neutrally describing somebody who has functions that are different from other people. So I quite like that functional diversity. As we mentioned before, the word dumb you should stay away from. Now, I remember when I was younger, dumb used to be used a lot to describe people and also deaf, D-E-A-F, for people who had problems hearing and blind, B-L-I-N-D, for people who had problem seeing well again keep away from those it's better for a blind person to call them visually impaired if something is impaired it's affected in some way and obviously visually your vision has been affected by the condition that you have so a visually impaired person is the correct expression for somebody who doesn't have perfect vision Uh, How can you talk about someone who can't hear very well, Reza? One very useful euphemism is the expression hard of hearing. So that goes together. Hard of hearing. Hard of hearing. In other words, a person who finds it a bit harder to hear than the average person. I said before the word deaf. Now, deaf is an adjective and the noun is deafness. And blind is also an adjective, and the noun is blindness. If a person has those two conditions, you should refer to them in a politically correct way as dual sensory impairment. Dual, that's two, D-U-A-L, dual sensory from sense, the sense of uh, sight and the sense of hearing, impairment. Again, these words you can see written in the show notes, englishpodcast.com slash 397. So if a person has dual sensory impairment, it's a combination of both visual and hearing impairments. So we've spoken about some ways of describing the actual disability. Here are some other useful words which often appear when you're talking about disability in general. The word access, for example, that's a very important word, access. And there are some collocations like access aisle. Also, you can talk about accessibility, the noun in general. Uh, You can talk about the things being accessible. So the adjective accessible ending I-B-L-E. And there are other common collocations such as wheelchair accessible or wheelchair friendly is another way of saying wheelchair accessible. Can you think of any more, Craig? Going back to the adjective accessible, yeah, you can describe tourism, which is Carla's interest, as... um accessible tourism. Accessible tourism is making tourism friendly for people who have disabilities. And a facility can be accessible. If it's an accessible facility, it has wheelchair access, for example, and uh, people can visit it with disabilities. And as I mentioned before, the idea of accessibility in apps, mobile phone applications, websites, screen readers, That's often spoken about as accessibility. So, for example, Apple has better accessibility for their computers than Microsoft. Another word you might hear mentioned when talking about disability is the word amputee, which ends in double E, like employee, interviewee. So an interviewee is a person who has been interviewed, right? So an amputee is a person who has been amputated. That means that they have had a body part removed, part of an arm or a finger, a leg, etc. So they are an amputee. And also something that's become very common in recent years on television and when people are giving presentations, and that's sign language. Very often you see someone on a stage speaking 
or giving a speech on television, maybe a politician, and next to that person is another person signing or giving sign language to people who are hard of hearing. Another word which I think is fairly universal is the word braille. I better spell it because I'm not sure if it's the same in Spanish. I think it is, yeah. Is it? Mm-hmm. Well, just to check, B-R-A-I-L-L-E, but the way we pronounce it in English is Braille. And I know it's named after Louis Braille, the French man who invented it. And as you probably know, it's a system to read. Your fingers touch bumps, little alterations of the smoothness of paper. And that way you can interpret it as letters. Some people who have disabilities, people with disabilities, need someone to look after them. So they have carers or caregivers. That's also an important word to know in this area of disability. A caregiver or a carer will look after or take care of the person who has the disability. If you are disabled or if you've ever at any time in your life had to use, even temporarily, a wheelchair you probably have had to use a ramp, R-A-M-P. So a ramp is whenever you can move from a higher to a lower level or vice versa, because a ramp has been put between the two positions. If you didn't have the ramp, you wouldn't be able to go there in a wheelchair. We've been trying to get a ramp installed in our building where we live in our block of flats for many, many years. We have stairs going up, four or five stairs going up to the lift, the elevator. But we need a ramp next to it so that people can push the trolleys, the shopping trolleys. You know, when you get a bit older, you're not, your mobility is affected. It's not so easy for you to climb stairs. And also for wheelchairs, for wheel, wheelchair access, it's important to have a ramp in buildings. Another important thing to gain access to buildings is a handrail for people, particularly who are not so stable on their feet. That means they could fall over easily. They need somewhere to put the hand. Well, all of us do, in fact, don't we? But it's particularly useful if you have problems walking. So that like bar, metal or perhaps wooden bar that goes along the wall, which gives you support, that's a handrail. If you are a person who is hearing impaired or hard of hearing, then you may need a hearing aid. A-I-D. You might recognise that word aid from first aid, for example. It kind of means help. So a hearing aid helps you to hear better. My dad for years had a a hearing aid and my mum used to shout at him because he never wore it. He never put it in his ears. Why don't you put your hearing aid in? There are other types of aids, particularly for moving around. So if you need something to help you, to aid you move around, you might need a mobility aid. That could be something as simple as a walking stick. Just a stick, a piece of wood, which has been shaped in a way so that you can hold it in your hand and push against the ground, a walking stick. Or maybe crutches. Crutches are for people who may have a permanent or a temporary disability. For example, if you've broken your leg and you're hoping that it's going to it's going to heal, it won't be broken forever, you'll still be given a mobility aid, you'll be given crutches, and you can rest your weight on the crutches rather than on the leg which has been affected. Or if you're more severely affected than that, you might in fact need a walking frame. That's the one which kind of goes around the front and side of you. We associate it above all with older people, but anybody might have to use one. They used to call them years ago a Zimmer frame. Yeah, that must have been the person who invented them. Some of them have wheels. Some of them don't. They just have rubber things at the bottom of the frame. And you move the frame a little in front of you and then you lean on it, put your weight on it and keep moving like that. My mum had a walking frame for many years. They're very useful if you need them, obviously. And if you're more severely affected, then perhaps you need a wheelchair. You need a chair that has wheels because you actually can't put your weight, your legs won't support your weight. So you, you need a wheelchair. I can tell you a funny story about a wheelchair. 
my wife once had an operation on her knee and she could walk, but we went to a museum in Valencia with some friends who were visiting from the UK and she needed a wheelchair because she couldn't walk around the museum after the operation. And they were very helpful and they found a wheelchair for her. So my friend who was visiting from England pushed her around in a wheelchair and she realized how sometimes it's very difficult to see things when you're sitting in a chair. So once she stood up to see one of the exhibits in the museum and started walking around to see the exhibit properly, and my friend shouted in a really busy museum, it's a miracle, it's a miracle, she can walk. <laughs> <laughs> and she was so embarrassed, she had to sit back down in a wheelchair, oh, wow. covered her head, put her head in her hands, there's a similar thing to a wheelchair, but a slightly more modern and slightly more jazzed up. Jazz, yeah. If you jazz something up, like you make it somehow more attractive or a bit, bit better. A mobility scooter. What for you is a mobility scooter? It's something you sit in that has a small motor and it's independent. Um, you don't need someone to push you as you do in a wheelchair and you don't need to push the wheels with your hand because the motor will push you along in this chair. So a mobility scooter has its own power and you don't need to do anything. Just press the button and it moves you. Do you know where the mobility scooter capital of Europe is? It's a commonly asked pub quiz trivia question. Is it the Vatican? It's Benidorm. Really? Yeah. Which makes sense. Why? Lots of... The retired people. Lots of retired British people who need mobility scooters go there on holiday. Benidorm apparently has far more mobility scooters per head of population than anywhere else in Europe. Nothing to do with the British people being too drunk to walk around anywhere. Well, there might be the odd drunk person <laughs> who has uh, taken the easy option to get home. <laughs> yeah, easier than a taxi. Just leave it outside the pub. If you are sight impaired, if you have uh, problems with your vision, then a white cane will help you. Because a white cane not only helps you to move and feel your way around the streets and around buildings, but also people can see that you are visually impaired and that you maybe need some extra space while you're moving and that you, you can't react as quickly as other people can. And last, but by no means least, we have guide dog. Those amazing dogs, which after a lot of training are able to guide, to lead people who are visually impaired around busy cities or even country places where it's quiet. You name it, I don't know how they do it. I would find it quite hard to do, but these dogs somehow manage it. They're amazing. Yep, they are. They're lovely, lovely animals, guide dogs, and, and so useful and so helpful. Well, we hope you found this collection of expressions and words useful. And if you have any more questions on this topic, we'll be more than happy to answer them for you. And thank you very much, Carla, for your question. We'd also be particularly interested to hear from anyone who's listening who has a disability. Do you think it's affected the way you learn English? I'm thinking that maybe podcasts are a very useful resource for anybody who is visually impaired. But please let us know if you're out there listening and you've had any problems learning English because of your disability. And if there's anything Reza and I can do to help you improve your English. And how can you get in touch? Well, we'd love to hear your voice. So you can send us a voice message. Go to speakpipe, S-P-E-A-K-P-I-P-E dot -E com slash English podcast and leave your message there. How can people reach us by email, Reza? You could write to Craig at EnglishPodcast.com or me, BelfastReza at gmail.com. If you're interested in a paid course to help your English, visit the Mansion Inglés online store. You'll find that at store, S T O R E dot mansioningles.net. And as always, we'd like to thank all of you who are helping us by supporting 
the podcast through the Patreon scheme. You could join the program for as little as $1.20 per month. And by donating that money, you get access to recent transcriptions. If you are interested, have a look at the show notes. There's a link to patreon.com slash English podcast. Unfortunately, we don't have time to thank all of our Patreon supporters, but we will say hello and thank you to our latest supporters who have joined us on Patreon this month. They are long-time listener and friend of the show, Erasmo Melo. Thank you, Erasmo. Gabriela Mendez, Jorge Prado de la Cruz. What a fantastic name. Jorge Prado de la Cruz. Jaime Gallego and Christian. Thank you very much, all of you and everyone who is supporting us on our Patreon program. What's next week, Reza? Next week, we've got singular nouns with plural verbs. There you go. So today, vocabulary. Next week, a bit of grammar for you. Thank you so much for listening this week. If you enjoyed the podcast, please tell your friends and we'll be back next week with another episode for you. Until next time, it's goodbye from Reza. And it's goodbye from Craig. The music in this podcast is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later. 